You know, this topic that I have is one that's been addressed many times. In fact, if you search the internet and you search for uh, the topic of how to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah, you'll come up with a lot of results. And SubhanAllah Azim, the question that I always used to get every time I'd complete this subject, in any conference, in any masjid, is a person would take me to the side feeling extremely guilty, and you could see the sadness on their faces, and they'd say, Shaykh, but I don't love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, I know I'm supposed to. I know that you know, I love his personality when I hear about him, but I don't feel a closeness and affinity to, to the Prophet I certainly don't love him more than my mom, more than my wealth, and so on and so forth. And SubhanAllah, that made me arrange this topic completely differently, and I want to take a, a totally different approach to this topic. And SubhanAllah, there's the one hadith that, that always st strikes me. And that is the hadith of Rabi'ah ibn Ka'ab al-Aslami radiallahu ta'ala anhu who says, as is narrated in Sahih Muslim, that I used to spend my night in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I used to always be around him. And I used to always bring his water for his wudu. So he enjoyed a close companionship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at me and he told me, salni, ask. Ask me anything. What do you want, O Rabi'ah? And imagine if the Prophet ﷺ, whose dua is mustajab, was to ask you, ask me for anything. You've got it, I'll give it to you. And Rabi'ah, without even any hesitation, he didn't think about it. He didn't say, let me think about it and tell you tomorrow. Immediately he said to the Prophet ﷺ, As'aluka murafataka fil jannah. I ask for your companionship in Jannah, Ya Rasulullah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he looked at him, and that's not a normal human response. I mean, he could have combined something with dunya and akhirah. You've got your wish, go ahead and ask. So the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Awa ghayra dhalik, is there anything else that you want to ask for? And he said, that's it, ya Rasulullah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him, فَأَعِنِّي عَلَى نَفْسِكَ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ So support me, support me. Meaning, help yourself achieve that. Help me in your request, bi kathratis sujood, by increasing your prostrations and increasing your sujood. And subhanAllah, I asked my teacher a question. I asked my Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Abid Hafidullah, I told him, you know, how come this hadith in Riyadh al Salihin is not with the rest of the ahadith that talk about as salawat ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There's an entire chapter in Riyadh al Salihin. That talks about the virtue of sending salawat and the virtue of loving the Prophet wasallam. How come an Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah didn't place it in that chapter? And he said, which chapter did he place it in? And you know which chapter he placed it in? Mujahadatun nafs. Striving against the self. And subhanAllah, there's a lot of wisdom into why an Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah placed the hadith there rather than with the rest of the ahadith. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah at tawbah قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ Say if your fathers, وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ And your sons, وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ Your brothers, وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with your wealth. وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا and, and the business that you would be afraid of losing. وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا and your, and your homes that you love. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a challenge. Allah azza wa jalla says, أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِي وَجِهَادٌ فِي سَبِيلِ If all of that is more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and jihadun fi sabili and struggling in His cause. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, is, this is a very serious threat to us. But I want you to look at all of the categories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and think about this. Everything that Allah mentioned, your fathers, your, your sons, your brothers, your sisters, your, you know, your parents, your money, your business, your sense of commerce, your homes, all of those things fall under the category of hub fitri. You love these things by nature. As a human being, we love all these people and we love these things. Every single person has this love inside of them. This is hub fitri. And loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also hub fitri. It's a natural love. We all incline towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even an atheist who says he doesn't incline to, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a liar. It's inside of all of us. If a person 
doesn't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's because of their own desires, it's because of their own ingratitude and things of that sort. But we naturally incline towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know what? The same is not true with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Imam ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah said, the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not hub fitri, it's hub ikhtiyari. You choose to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You fall in love with his attributes. And you know what? That's why if I ask each and every single one of you, you've been sitting in this conference all day listening to these amazing things about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If I asked you now, do you love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now? more than you did this morning, would anybody in the audience say no? We all do, right? It's only natural because it's jihad and nafs. You struggle against yourself to love the Prophet ﷺ. You learn about the Prophet ﷺ. You listen to his seerah and you naturally fall in love with his character and his attributes. You naturally want to draw closer to him ﷺ, right? If you listen to a seerah on, or you listen to a lecture on a shama'il, on the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, you naturally start to love him more. And that's why the seerah occupied such a position in this deen that Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said it was taught the way that the Qur'an was taught. Because the Qur'an brings us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the seerah brings us to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why I guarantee you that if you take the advice of Shaykh Yasir hafizahullah when he spoke about studying the seerah and spoke about taking those steps in your life so that you can start to learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more you listen to the life, about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the more you will love him alayhi salatu wa sallam. The more you will want to be like him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it starts off with that, with that understanding that this is a struggle. And don't feel bad that it's a struggle. And as long as we first start off with that understanding, because if you don't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means that there is an obstacle. If you don't love the Prophet sallallahu it could mean that you just haven't learned enough about him, that you're just not applying enough of his sunnah in your life. And I want to share with you a story that Shaykh Muhammad Hassan shared once, and I'm sure some of you may have seen it. Said that a young man once went to his teacher, and he said, how do I dream of the Prophet ﷺ? I really want to see the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. You know, how sweet is it when you close your eyes at night and you are looking at the Prophet ﷺ? There is no feeling in the world that could parallel that feeling. Right? How jealous should we be of Anas and who used to see the Prophet ﷺ every single night? Wow! How lucky and blessed is Anas anhu. We all want that blessing to see the Prophet ﷺ because the Prophet ﷺ said it also has implications. Whoever sees me in his sleep has indeed seen me. This is a good sign. This is a great bushra. And this young man comes to a shaykh and he says, I want to see the Prophet ﷺ. He said, okay, well, let's eat dinner. And he served him a dinner that was full of salt. Just threw salt all over the food. And the young man is eating this food and he thought this must be some kind of weird approach to it, you know. <laughs> this is how you see the Prophet ﷺ eat salty food, really salty food. And the Shaykh didn't give him any water to drink. And then he went to sleep that night. And he woke up in the morning and the Shaykh asked him, what did you see last night? He said, I saw waterfalls and oceans and seas and rivers. <laughs> I just saw bodies of water everywhere. And the Shaykh said, there's your answer. If you desire the Prophet ﷺ, if you love the Prophet ﷺ, if he's occupying your thoughts, he's occupying your heart, you will see the Prophet ﷺ. You see what that means, subhanAllah? So it starts off with that understanding that this is about jihad and nafs. Do not underestimate the importance of learning about him ﷺ. And keep that effort going. Don't wait for the next conference on seerah. Make it a habit to study the seerah. Even if you've read Raheek al-Maktoum, read it again. Read it over and over again. Listen to lectures about the Prophet ﷺ and live the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And obviously it starts off when we talk about how do we be with the, how can we be with the Prophet ﷺ in Al-Jannah. Obviously the most simple way 
and I noticed that not everyone is doing this. The most simple way is what was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that the closest to me, the nearest to me on the day of judgment is the one who most frequently sends salawat upon me, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Every time you hear his name, say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even if it gets tire, tiring, keep on saying sallallahu alayhi wasallam because it will benefit you and you will not regret a single moment in which you sent salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But let's move on to another part of that, another portion of that. How do we build upon that? And you know, I studied this topic and SubhanAllah, I'm telling you, this is the first time I'm approaching this topic differently. Because every time you talk about this, I'm telling you, people pull me to the side and ask all of the other mashayikh and say, I don't feel that love towards the Prophet wasallam. I'm afraid. You know, when I hear the hadith of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where the Prophet wasallam said that, you know, your iman is not complete until I am more beloved to you than your wealth, than your family, than everything. And you hear that and that shakes you because this becomes an issue of Iman. But I wanted to study something and I want you to think about this. And I'm gonna ask this question. I can't really see you guys because I just see a bunch of bright lights. I don't know if it's nude from your faces or it's the convention center, but I'm sure it's a combination of both. Who are the neighbors of the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah? Who are they? I want to hear some answers. I can't see you, so you got to talk loud. Who are the neighbors of the Prophet ﷺ in Jannah? <laughs> Rasulullah ﷺ specified two companions, and I'll give you a hint, they're not Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. They have their own virtues. But Rasulullah ﷺ specified his two neighbors in Jannah. Talha and Zubair radiallahu anhumah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic hadith, Talha wa Zubair, Jaraya fil Jannah. They are my neighbors in, in paradise. Those are my two neighbors. If you want to go to the neighborhood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah, when we go to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, we'll pass by the houses of Talha and Zubair. And I thought to myself, why Talha and Zubair? I never asked myself this question. I've taught about Asha Mubashri in Jannah many times. Never asked myself that question. And subhanAllah, there is something very unique about both Talha and Zubair. As Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the first sword that was raised in the cause of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When as Zubair radiallahu anhu was a young man in Mecca and he heard that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had been attacked, he ran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi with his sword to defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sees as Zubair running towards him with his sword drawn, panting, ready to fight somebody. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, what are you doing? He says, Ya Rasulullah, sami'atu annaka ukhith. I heard that somebody hurt you. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and what were you going to do if that was the case? <laughs> Rasulullah and Zubair radiallahu anhu said, I was going to strike him with this sword. I was ready to fight in your cause. And that's why as Zubair radiallahu anhu is the first sword that was drawn in the cause of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What about Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu? What is the day of Talha as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to call it? The day of Uhud. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to look back and he used to say, Talha. That was the day of Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was the day of Uhud. Why? Because Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu suffered over 70 wounds in the cause of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that day. Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu extended his hand when an arrow was shot towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his hand was paralyzed, was paralyzed. He didn't think to himself, if I catch an arrow, that's not gonna be that's not gonna be pretty. He didn't think twice. He saw that the Prophet ﷺ was being harmed and he put his hand out there. And he went and he guarded the Prophet ﷺ when the people fled. And the Prophet ﷺ saw Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu beat up, unconscious, wounded all over the place, just protecting him and defending him when others fled. And Rasulullah ﷺ looked at him in awe. SubhanAllah, look at the quality of, of, of his companions. He looked at them. And even in those moments where the Prophet ﷺ himself had to be carried, Rasulullah ﷺ, he says to the Sahaba, whoever wants to see a shaheed, a martyr that is still walking on the face of the earth, look at Talha ibn Ubaidullah. He's a living martyr, SubhanAllah, because of the effort that he put forth for the Prophet ﷺ that day. So when you hear Talha wa Zubair Jaraya fil Jannah, 
that they are my neighbors in Jannah. There's a reason why they occupy that. Because those two men can say that they love the Prophet ﷺ. And if you want proof, here, look at all the wounds. They could say without a doubt that they sacrificed their families, that they sacrificed themselves for the sake of the Prophet ﷺ. And we have to ask ourselves that question, that if we were there in the time of the seerah, if we were there when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, would we have been on the side of the Prophet ﷺ? Would we have been willing to make those same sacrifices that the Prophet ﷺ, that, that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ made? Abu Jahl was not an idiot. His name was Abu Al-Hakam, the father of wisdom. Abu Lahab was not an ignorant man. Abu Lahab was corporate Quraysh. He was a wealthy man, businessman. When you think of Abu Lahab, don't think of a guy that's, you know, that's got like a one badge on his eye and you know, looking like Captain Hook and has a big fat belly and walking around in raggedy clothes and calling out to the Prophet ﷺ. No, that was corporate Quraysh. That was Wall Street back then. That's why he was mad at the Prophet ﷺ. What happened? Their love for the other things were too much. They loved the dunya too much and that's why they couldn't love the Prophet ﷺ. It wasn't possible because their love, even their fitri love, the natural love that a person has for those other things went out of control. And they couldn't love the Prophet ﷺ because he called them against that and they weren't willing to make the sacrifices. But Talha and Zubair were. So the first question that you got to ask yourself, if I was in that position, would I have stood in front of the Prophet ﷺ and let the arrow strike me? Would I have made those same sacrifices that Talha and Zubair radiallahu anhuma made? That's true love. Talha wa Zubair, jaraya fil jannah. And then we look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And in essence, the people that will be like the, with the Prophet ﷺ are the ones that are most like him. As we know, Rasulullah ﷺ said in the authentic hadith of Sahar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that whoever sponsors an orphan in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether he's a relative or a stranger, كَانَ مَعِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ كَهَاتَيْنِ Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, he pointed, he showed what the Prophet sallallahu did, that he will be with me in paradise the way that the middle finger is with the index finger. He will be with me in Jannah like this. You want to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you take up the cause of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You take up the, that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, Man rabba tiflatayn. This is in, uh, in Sahih Muslim. Man rabba tiflatayn. Wa ahsana tarbiyatuhuma. Whoever raises two girls, you know, in, in our cultures, unfortunately, many, time, many times the birth of a daughter is a loss. Wallahi, it's more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever raises two daughters and perfects their tarbiyah, he does good with raising them. Yakunu sahibi yawm al qiyamati kahatayn. Rasulullah said, He will be with me on the day of judgment like these two fingers. Allahu Akbar. Because that's the character of the Prophet. And if you want something even more direct than that, then look at what the Prophet said in the Hassan hadith in the Targheeb. Rasulullah said, Inna ahabbakum ilayya wa aqrabakum minni yawm al qiyamah. The most beloved of you to me. And the ones that are closest to me on the Day of Judgment are the ones who have the best character. The people of khuluq, the people of character. Husn al khuluq. At the end of the day, what are we talking about here when we're talking about being with the Prophet ﷺ? That everything that we hear, there are two responses that we should have to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Number one, that the seerah should resonate with me. It should be reflected inside of me. I should develop a love of the Prophet ﷺ. So it should be reflected inside of me. And number two, it should be reflected to the people around me. It should show to the people around me also through character, not just through wearing a thobe, not just through doing something that's external. No, through having the character of the Prophet ﷺ. How many times do we see people that adopt the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ on the outside, but have the most rotten characters? Come on, let's call it how it is. I was there, a lot of people were there. You know, a person dresses in a certain way, adopts certain practices that are debatable whether or not they even fall into the sunnah that are supposed to be applied, that, that, that are necessary to be applied or rewardable. But they treat their parents like garbage. They look down upon other Muslims. They have kibir. 
That's not what's going to get you close to the Prophet I don't care how short your thobe is when you come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. There is no thobe on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You're naked on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You better have some character to show for yourself. The other stuff is secondary. Because the people that Rasulullah loves most are the ones that are like him most. That have the inner qualities of the Prophet That are forbearing. That treat the people well. That treat the orphans well. That treat their families well. That give a, give a good impression of the deen. You're talking about loving the Prophet and we saw what happened around the world where you had some protests, because by the way, the media likes to overblow things. We know that there's no doubt about that. There was 196 demonstrations in Pakistan. Three of them were violent. The media made it, say, made it seem as if every protest in Pakistan was violent. Yeah, they like to portray that. But let's face it, some of the people that are sitting there demonstrating, yeah, SubhanAllah, I'll never forget, the very first demonstration that I saw on TV in the cause of the Prophet a guy is holding up a sign and he's holding a cigarette in his other hand. MashaAllah. Talk about supporting the cause of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's like puff puff Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? That's not doing you any good on the Day of Judgment. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're offended. There's a hypocrisy there. When you say that you're offended because you're hurt because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hurt. How many of you, how many of us Muslims watch Family Guy? Let's face it, watch, portray, watch them portray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God billah, with a gray beard committing zina and drinking alcohol. You didn't get offended by that, now you decided to get hurt? That's a joke. You love the Prophet sallallahu you be like him. And you know what, if 10 million people in this country were acting like the Prophet sallallahu not a single person would dare to insult the Prophet sallallahu that way. If we lived what the Prophet ﷺ taught us, if we had that khuluq that the Prophet ﷺ taught us, no one would dare to do those types of things because they would know who the Prophet ﷺ is through us. But if the people, all they know about the Prophet ﷺ is that he was a jerk who owned a, a grocery store in my neighborhood who sold me haram. He was a rude taxi driver. I was a rude patron at a restaurant. Those are, the, those are the Muslims, reinforcing stereotypes. What do you expect them to think of the Prophet ﷺ? You're not supporting the cause of the Prophet ﷺ, you're hurting it. You live that khuluq of the Prophet ﷺ. That's what love of him means today. That's what being with him means on the Day of Judgment. And then we see that loving him in truth, SubhanAllah is our only hope at the end of the day. Truly loving the Prophet ﷺ, there's no way around it. There's no way around it. Mujahadut nafs. You got to fight yourself. It is struggle. It is striving to really develop that affection towards the Prophet ﷺ and to live the life of the Prophet ﷺ. At-Tabarani, rahimahullah, he narrates uh, an authentic hadith that a young man came to the Prophet, that Rasulullah ﷺ saw a young man and that young man was in grief. And Rasulullah ﷺ asked him, Ma yubkik, why are you crying? Ya Ghulam, ma yubkik, why are you crying, O young man? Rasulullah cared about him. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are more beloved to me than myself, more beloved to me than my children, more beloved to me than my parents. When I'm at home, I think of you. And when I think of you, I can't wait to see you. And when I can't wait to see you, atayituka bil masjid, I just come to the masjid and see you. Right? I don't have to sit there and wonder, when am I going to get the chance to see you? I just go and I see you in the masjid. And he says, then I remembered my death and your death. And he mentioned his death first, although he was much younger than the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, I remembered that when you enter Jannah, when you entered paradise, you're going to be in the companionship of the Prophets. And I fear that even if I enter paradise, SubhanAllah, look at the himma of this young man. Look at his ambition. Even if I get to Jannah, even if I make it to paradise, I'm not going to be able to be on your level. I'm not going to be able to see you. I'm going to be down there with the masakeen of al-Jannah. Now, if you ask any one of us, being masakeen of al-Jannah, we'll be fine with that, right? As long as we don't go to hell. Look at the way these people thought. He said, I know I'm not going to get a chance to be with you. And At-Tabarani, in his narration, which is a more extensive narration of this incident, it is a hadith that is Hassan. 
He says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa comforted him, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't answer him until Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the ayah in Surah Al-Nisa, وَمَن يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ And whoever follows, obeys Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they will be with those upon whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed His favor from the Prophets, from the truthful ones, from the martyrs, from the righteous, وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا And what a beautiful companionship it will be. What a, what, a great, what a great gathering to be in. And that's what it means to be with the Prophets. And it's not just Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You want to be like Talha and Zubair and be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You want to be the Rafiq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You want to be close to him. I want to share with you a narration. It's not about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it's about Musa alayhi wa sallam. You know, Musa alayhi salam, when he was struggling with his ummah, and his ummah really gave him a very hard time. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi even felt sorry for him. And he said, Musa alayhi salam had to put up with a lot more than I have to put up with. When Musa alayhi salam chooses the best 70 people, after that, after that embarrassment of, of building a cow to worship, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered them. And then those 70 say, Arina Allah jahra. Show us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We won't believe in you until we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to test them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to command Bari Israel to murder, to kill those who, who were the perpetrators of shirk amongst themselves. And Musa alayhi salam is sitting in this desert for 40 years, prevented from entering Al Quds because of the nation that he has around them, because of who the people are. That, have, that he's been surrounded by. And Musa alayhi salam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Man rafiqi fil jannah? I want to know who my rafiq is in jannah. You know, I want to know who my companion is going to be in jannah. I'm looking at this ummah of mine, and I'm not seeing any eligible candidates here. Man rafiqi fil jannah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed Musa alayhi salam that the person that walks in next is your rafiq in al jannah. And the person that walked in was not an abid, he wasn't a worshiper, he wasn't someone that was known amongst Bani Israel. He was a young man. And Musa salam didn't know who he was. And so Musa salam was like, okay, either this means I'm very low in Jannah, or this, and we know that that's not the case because Rasulullah saw him in Isra' al Mi'raj, he was only under Ibrahim. Salam. Or there's something special about this young man. So Musa salam asked this young man, he said, what's your story? He asked him about himself. And the young man, all he had to say was, Aqumu ala ummi. I, I serve my mother. And he said, and every time, subhanAllah, wa kullama khadamtuha bi khidmatin, every time I serve her, qalat Allahumma ja'al waladi hadha rafiqa Musa fil jannah. <laughs> oh Allah, make my, this son of mine the rafiq of Musa alayhi salam in al jannah. It's being like these people, it's doing the things that they taught us. Having the khuluq of the Prophet وسلم, the internal qualities of the Prophet وسلم, that allow us to attain that level. And we have to seriously ask ourselves, if we're not willing to spare the time to study the life of the Prophet وسلم, and study the characteristics and the shamal of the Prophet وسلم, how are we supposed to develop this love which is hub ikhtiyari? which is a, a love that is based on choice, not on fitrah. So I challenge you all first and foremost to do that and to see how you can apply the life of the Prophet in your life and to continue listening to his life over and over and over again. And I want to end with one thing and, and I'll, as a disclaimer from the very start, I'm not Bona Muhammad and I'm not Ammar. I don't write poetry anymore. I used to write poetry. Every once in a while I'll write poetry, but I wouldn't do it as good as he would do it anyway. All right, and I admit that. And subhanAllah, as I was on the plane from Baltimore today, I wanted to just write something. It's not a poem, so don't expect it to rhyme. It's not spoken word, but a reflection. What would it be like to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jannah? So I want you all to put your cell phones down and imagine for a moment. Don't talk to each other, just imagine for a moment. And the scene is that you're in Jannah. Imagine sitting with your spouse in your palace in Jannah and then deciding on what the plans would be for that day. Should we go outside, sit on our thrones with the waterfalls of milk and honey flowing beneath us? 
and enjoy a cup of Jannah wine while smelling the sweet scent of Jannah musk? Should we go to the souq, to the marketplace and meet all of our old friends that we used to kick it with in the dunya and talk about how dun what dunya was like and how we all made it here and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed his favor upon us? And then your spouse says, you know what? How about we go visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam today? And so you and your spouse go hand in hand, walking towards the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You pass by the homes of Talha and Zubair radiallahu anhuma, and you say salam to them. And then you go and you knock on the door of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. And lo and behold, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam opens with a big smile on his face and says, Ahlan wa marhaban, welcome, and embraces you, and invites you to sit inside his home, in his noble living room, and sits right across from you, and asks you, would you like a cup of Jannah tea? <laughs> not Jannah tea, Jannah, Jannah tea. It's not Desi chai, all right? Closer to Somali tea, because that stuff is awesome. Do you like a cup of tea? And you sit in the home of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives you a cup of tea. And he sits in front of you and he gives you his undivided attention. Imagine what that discussion would be like. What would you tell him? What would you ask him? Would you tell him about your favorite moment in the seerah? Or how Shaykh Yasir Birjas taught you about his smile? Or would you ask him what Ta'if was really like? and how he still managed to remember us as the blood spilled from his noble face. But in Jannah, there are no more tears and no more fears, just the sweetness of success and sacrifice. Imagine him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, telling you an inside joke between him and Aisha, or the time he caught Anas playing with the kids instead of running his errands. What if he told you, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how he remembered you or how he knew your name and longed for the moment when he would meet you. What if he told you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that I remember when your salah and your salam reached me and I answered to you, Wa alayka salam, O so and so. What if at the end of that conversation, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam extended his hand and offered you a sip of water? after which you would never again feel thirst, not physically nor spiritually, for the only sight more noble and beautiful than the face of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the face of the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Lord of you. And for that, all you have to do is look up and you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't worry about time, don't worry about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam getting annoyed or getting tired of you or having to, or, or having to entertain other guests. Because in Al-Firdaus, you'll never have to be left to imagine again. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant us the companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and his family and the Siddiqun and the Shuhada in the highest level of Jannat Al-Firdaus. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that just as we sit here, and we remember him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah azza wa jal does not disappoint us by not allowing us to actually see him while he's pleased with us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who follow his sunnah and who will be embraced by him on the day of judgment and not turned away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him more beloved to us than our families and our wealth and everything in this dunya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the pleasure of staring at His noble face. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi lakum. Jazakum Allahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.